Thank you. Well done. Well, this morning, we've had the privilege already for the first service, and the second service is with Mark Banyan. Here's how it works. You ready? This is the fine print. He starts. He makes a start. All right? He makes a start. So he made a start in the first service. The second service, he, he goes to another level. So you get the benefit of, of the, the next level. Then tonight he's going to culminate. And who knows what's going to happen? Only the Lord knows. But he gets better. He's like, he's like the wine. He gets better. Now, you were really good in the first service. You were good, brother. You were really good. So no pressure. No pressure. But he is a, a dear man and his wife, Jane. They're friends. They are. They're, they're part of us. And so um, we welcome you. So let's give him a change point welcome and have Mark come. Oh, boy, I'm in big trouble. I just really got whacked, and I'm really enjoying it. I don't want to stop it, so so maybe, maybe God's going to do something. Hey, listen, um, so I got three things I wasn't planning to do, but that's kind of how I roll. And um, so the first one is, you notice there's no men's breathe night. Right? Like, it's all about the women who have to breathe. What about us guys? Right? So, all right, guys, I want you to all stand up. This, this is what we're going to do, because this is our moment, right? Guys, this is our moment. Guys, this is our moment. All right, what we do, we don't breathe, we shout, right? All right? So what you're going to do, ladies, I'm sorry if this is too big. You can put your fingers in your ears. But we're going to just do a man thing right now, because we got to get this out of us, right? Right? Some guys are going, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's okay. It'll come. All ready? So don't shout to yourself. Shout to the Lord. On three. One, two, three. Yeah! Okay. That was the warm-up. Okay, so now what you have to do is you got to step out of your seat. Come on, quick, we don't have a lot of time. Come on, step out of your seat, just into the aisle, somewhere else. Get your hands out of your pockets, yeah. right? Get your hands out of your pockets. So, and if you're standing like this, don't. Put your hands out like this, okay? Shake your hands out a little bit. Bit like a haka, right? Yeah. All right. Oh, all right. One, two, three. Ha! <laughs> Wait, don't sit down. I didn't say sit down. I didn't say sit down. One more time. I want you to get with a brother. And in this case, you link an arm with a brother or put your arm around him, okay? Come on, David's all alone up here. And sorry, ladies, just it'll be over soon. <laughs> so this time, it's a shout of agreement. And it's simple. We're just going to say, we are the sons of God. We are the sons of the Most High. And we are going to shout over the earth. The God in these days is revealing his sons and his daughters. But right now, it's our shout. Right? On three. One. We agree, right? What? Do we agree? Like, no shouting if you don't agree. Like, if it's kind of like iffy. We don't shout on iffies. Right? Do we agree? Yes. We are the sons of the Most High God. Yes. One, two, three. Whoa! Yes. 
Yeah. Woo! Woo! All right. Well, Father, we thank you for this service today. And Father, we'll come back next Sunday and we'll shout again. Okay, one more thing, a couple more things. So if you have, let me just get my Bible here. Where did I put it? If you have an ankle problem, stand up. If you have a kneel, uh, Neil, an ankle problem, a heel problem, stand up. You know, it's a funny thing. I was standing there. See if I can find it here. I'll come back to it later. So I was standing there. I started to have so much pain in my, my heel. I was sitting right beside you. <laughs> I was thinking, nah, that's not how it works. But if you have, a, if you have any pain in your ankle right now, in your heel, particularly, God's going to heal you. Because the way is forward. And he's enlarging your path. And your ankle, your ankle, your ankle, your ankle is meant to be straight and it's meant to be strong. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, for these men and women who have stood but represent the ankle of the house. Father, we declare that our bodies be strong in Jesus' name. We declare that every body part is good and has been given for the purpose of your glory. And Father, we pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, that you would release a victory in the house, a victory over the ankles because you are making a way for us to go forward. You are enlarging the path and our ankles are meant to keep us on foot, on path, going forward in your fullness. So Father, I pray right now, anybody standing beside you, just reach out and touch them right now. The people that are standing, just put a hand on them right now. In Jesus' name, release a healing anointing. Father, we pray that the same power that resurrected Lazarus from the grave would be released in the body and then that grave clothes can be then released. Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, every back straight, every leg straight, every hip straight, backs of necks, shoulder blades, collar bones that are out, bones that have broken and didn't, didn't heal well, God is going to straighten them. You're going to say, you're going to all of a sudden go back. Some of you will even go back to the doctor and have x-rays and say, this is miraculous. There's no more steel pins in your hip anymore, in your arm, in your leg. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. One last thing. This is my intro to my message. If you have financial difficulty, stand up, please, if you're willing. Financial difficulty. Okay, stand up. If you don't have financial difficulty, but you have no faith, when it comes to the kingdom of God and your money, there's no connection. Money's money, the kingdom of God is something totally different than stand up. I know that's hard to admit, but so often there's a separation in us where we can give so much to the Lord, but when it comes to trusting our finances to him, not just having the finances, but then releasing them back to him, stand up. If in that area you're totally set free, there is no struggle at all in your heart with your finances, then you can sit down, but if you struggle, stand up. Look, if I ask this enough times, I'll get everybody standing. So why don't we just all stand? Why not? Poor Lord. Now listen, listen to me. This is really important. We cannot afford. We cannot afford to believe that God is able in the area of our finances. We cannot afford to believe that. 
This is a time where we need to have faith. If there's any, you have all the freedom in the world, the last stronghold is often finances. Right? So you can get delivered of this demon and that demon and have freedom in the area of sexual purity and all that kind of stuff. But the last stronghold will be our finances and particularly as we get older. And so we cannot afford right now to not believe that God can do something in this area. Do you agree? And so, Father, I pray right now, lift your hands to heaven. Father, we right now agree as one that in this area of finances that's so secular and so worldly and so bound by the temporal that we're asking it to be invaded with eternity right now. We pray for things that are impossible to come. I pray for a release of faith in the area of finances. So often the prayer is just more, but before we need more, we need to be set free from this as a deciding factor in how we go forward. That we are set free from looking at, we live in a real world, we have to look at what's in our bank account, but we're set free. We do not redefine your destiny and purpose in our lives by how much money we have in the name of Jesus. And we need to be released. We need this to be broken. This is a stronghold. And so I'm going to ask you to do it right now with me. If you pray with me, pray in tongues, let's just take a minute. Because this is something that needs to be broken over the house of God. That we're not bound by the world. We're not bound by secular finances. We're not bound by global economies. Because we are part of this kingdom on earth. And so let's pray together right now. Let's just lift up our voice to the Lord. Father, we declare the victory. We declare freedom in this area, victory in this area. We break every bondage, Father, to our dependence. We break every bondage, Father, every ungodly link to our sense of security that comes from our money. We break every bondage, every link to our sense of identity and value because of how rich or poor we are in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Everybody said? Amen. I hope so. Amen. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I tell you, this is not random at all. This is not random at all. Going forward. Our next season, if, if, we're, if change is upon us, if we're about to go into a new season, then we need to be set free from the areas where we lack faith. You know, we can't afford, we have to give up our right to, be, to, to move in unbelief. Very true. We have to give that up. We have to decide. We think we have a right. I don't think we actually do. Right. But if we think we have a right, we have to decide that we don't have the right to say, I don't believe. Because every time we move in unbelief, we actually get in the way of what the Lord's doing. Does that make sense? And so if going forward, if, if enlargement, you know, ankles that are going forward, that's what the ankle thing's all about, right? You know, the shout of the Lord, it's about making a way. It's the dynamite that blows up the spiritual boulders. If we're going to go forward in the things of God, then we need to be set free from the strongholds where we allow those strongholds to continue to have influence over us because we, we operate in a level of unbelief. And it's not that we have faith in faith, but we have faith in the word of God. We have faith in his power. We have faith in the risen Christ. We have faith. We have faith in God speaking to us clearly by his Holy Spirit about his kingdom on earth. Amen? Amen. And so these are very key things for us to go forward pioneering, laying new foundations, moving forward in the things that God has for us. Take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Ephesians. Now, I have a little extra time, but I think I just used it all up. That's okay. Okay, just go. So, in the first service, I talked about about uh, the pioneering spirit, the pioneering, which, is the, which I believe is actually the spirit of Jesus. 
uh, I believe the, 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 the mandate, the mantle of Christ, the yoke that's easy and the burden that's light is a pioneering thing. I think it's an apostolic thing. I mean, it can be other things too, but in this case, I believe that God is, is speaking to his church right now about laying foundations, foundations that are about his kingdom on earth. There are good foundations. There's foundations that have already been laid. We don't need to re rip them up or replace them. In some cases, it's actually like, like adding a new wing to the house. So you, le you have these good foundations, and there, then there's other foundations that, that are laid for the, the addition. And then sometimes old foundations have rotten. They have been unattended or um, tended poorly, and they've decayed, and it's time to dig them out and relay. And this is, this is what the, the Lord is saying. And other times, we go to places where there's been no foundations. And God says, this is a good place. And so the word in the first service was I actually believe that, that, that there is a, you're coming into a season of pioneering, a season of pioneering. You've, you've just had your 10-year celebration, and it's so healthy, so good, so wonderful, so appropriate to take those moments to, to remember all that the Lord has done, the battles and the, you know, a few of the failures and bits and pieces. But overall, you think, look at what God has done and who we are and God being a cross-generational God is that he's going from generation to generation. It also means that when we stop to celebrate those things, what we're doing is we're passing on the story to the grandkids. And if we don't pass that story on to them, they won't know it. We need to, we need to sit with them and tell them about how good God's been. But it's time for the next generation to have their own story. That's it. It's not just about our story. You've got to have your own story. Not just, I remember mom and dad, and they did this, and I remember mom and dad, and when they came from Phoenix, and Faith Bible College, and mom and dad this, and mom and dad that. Those are great stories, and there's an inheritance in all of that for you guys, for some of you in your Christian homes that you grew up in, and, and uh, the faithful grandmothers, and so on and so forth, the uh, uncles and aunties of the faith. But there comes a time when you yourself need to have your own story, but particularly from generation to generation, because that's God design and that, that's how he works. There is a generation right now that needs its own story. Yeah. It's not just simply, where's Chris? Chris, it's not simply, hi, Michelle. It's not simply about singing songs, yeah. and you know that. And it's not just coming up with a new creative way of singing. It's about the reality of the living God, his presence, and a, hearing his voice, knowing his love in your heart, and then having an experience of his power that blows your circuits completely. So then, then you start walking in something of the kingdom, and day by day, your story is being given to you. And so that's what you guys are doing. You're in this. But it's time even for your generation. And I'm looking at John and Alyssa and Chris and Michelle. It's even time for your generation to start praying for the next generation. I mean, right now it's just having babies and kids. But, but they one day have to have their story, right? Are you with this? You know what it says, how do we ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart? And then it goes on to say, such is the generation, you know, when God looks down and sees a generation, he doesn't define it by age. He doesn't look at, here's the seniors, and here's the pre-seniors, and here's the, you know, the wishing to be seniors, hope one day I make it people. And, and then, then there's the people with big mortgages and small children, and then the people with no house and the idea of getting pregnant, and then there's the singles that are thinking, what's this all about, and so on and so forth. But when God looks down, he doesn't define it as the youth ministry and the seniors ministry and that ministry. He just looks down and says, these are all the people in the house of God that are alive yeah. Yeah. and that's the generation but for us we need to be sure that we are walking with God in an ongoing unfolding story of his presence with us on earth on earth on earth and so I believe that God is saying and this is a word particularly for this house I believe you've had this 10 year celebration and it's time to start to pioneer new things and they could be ministries, it could be planting of churches, um, it could be a variety of different things that may be launching people in the marketplace. I don't know, that's not for me to say right now, but I'm saying that there's something about pioneering that the Lord is speaking about very, very clearly. And he, uh, whenever it comes to pioneering, 
Um, first of all, we pray that God would raise up the architects. We need designs before we start to build. Have you ever seen some of those houses where some guy one day gets a brand new chainsaw and he thinks, I'm going to make something with this. <laughs> you know, rah, rah, rah. That's a guy thing, right? Uh, let's get up, have another show. <laughs> you know, and at the end of the day, you look at it and think, what is that? He says, it's a coffee table. Don't you recognize it? You know, we say, well, it started out as a house, but it ended, ended up as a coffee table. You know, it's better to have a plan, right? And here's one of the if you're making notes today, write this one down. God will always give a vision and plans before he calls you to do anything. And if you don't have a vision and you don't feel you have the plan, even though we have to step out in faith, that if you have no vision, then chances are the vision you have is yours, not his. If you don't have a divine vision for something, but you have an idea, chances are the vision is your idea rather than the vision of the Lord. And for pioneering things of the kingdom, you have to have the vision from God first, and then he gives you with that a plan. Before any, before any trees are um, uh, fallen, before any chainsaws start up, you have to have a plan. And the plan is a divine plan. You know, sometimes those plans take, take 10 years to download. You know, we always think that the download happens in a moment, and sometimes it does. But sometimes... In fact, I kind of go this way. Often, the bigger the plan, the longer it takes from the, from the day you put the shovel on the ground and say, we're starting today. He'll give the plans maybe in a moment, in a, in a down, quick download, but it'll take a long time for those big plans to actually start to manifest, to be realized. Remember Rick Joyner hearing him speak um, at a conference several years ago, and uh, it was the only time I've heard him speak other than YouTube. But he said this. He said, he's found, he said, don't ask for God for big, big plans uh, too early in your life because the bigger the plan, the longer you're going to have to wait for it to be fulfilled. <laughs> so, you know, if you're 20 right now and say, I want really, really, really big stuff, and God gives you the download, whoosh, like that, and then the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the thing dies. You know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I didn't hear from God. Maybe I wasn't good enough. That uh, You go through all that cycle, and you finally get to a point where you think, ah, uh, you know, it's just, and then God says, now's the time. And you go, you know, <laughs> why didn't we do that, you know, 30 years ago? And he yeah. said, well, you weren't ready. And you wanted it big, right? Who prays for small things? Right? Do not despise the day of small beginnings. But yet, on the other hand, we rarely pray for small. God, I want a vision of your glory, and I want it to be really tiny. I want a tiny little glory thing so I can control it, and I can make it happen in my own power and my own... We don't pray that, do we? Right? And so, I believe that God is calling you're about to step into a pioneering season. In the morning prayer meeting before it, John was talking about change and somebody else was saying about a new season and, and you, know, you know, you listen to what's, what's being said prophetically. You be, you know, like, it's not a secret. But you've got to listen to what's being said prophetically and then receive it, but don't grab the ball and rush off with it. You press into it some more and say, God, what are you saying? But over time, you need to do something. You can't do nothing nothing, then you haven't had faith to believe in what God's actually given you and what he's called you to do. So Ephesians, I'll eventually get to Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, verse 19. Oh, Mr. Bible man, show me a verse. Oh, there it is, okay. Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation. That's pioneering talk. Built on the foundation. You know, if you have anything to do with building, you don't put a roof, you don't build the roof first and put it on top of the ground. You know, you dig foundations. You usually start from the bottom up and eventually you get to a point, even if the, the roof has been prefabbed and it's waiting there in the corner, it's, used, it's like the crown on the top of everything. And so here, uh, it's talking about foundations, and in this case, the church's foundations, the church's foundations are of the apostles and the prophets with 
with uh, Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Verse 21, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. See, the rising comes out of the foundations. The lift comes out of the foundations. The elevation, the moving up rather than the sideways comes out of good foundations. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Oh, God, help me. I have a lot to say, and I'm going to do this really quickly. So you'll have to buy my book that I haven't written in five years from now. <laughs> Let's look at another verse quickly, and then I'll... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter... Chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into. We are living stones. Turn to the person beside you and say, you are a living stone. <laughs> you are building material. <laughs> you are not a house, you are a stone. You are not a dead stone, you are a living stone, but nonetheless, you are not the house in and of yourself. You are building material that God uses to build for himself a house in which he dwells in heaven, right? Yeah. Wrong, in which he dwells on earth. He's got a house in heaven. He doesn't need another house in heaven. That's true. Heaven is his dwelling place. He needs a house on earth. The glory of the Lord on earth. The way that God reveals his glory is by dwelling on earth with man. But the problem has been since Adam and Eve left the garden that when he comes down, nobody can go in. That's a picture of the tabernacle. That was a picture of the temple. God shows up. Everybody has to leave. God's heart is to come to earth and dwell on earth with man. And so he had to build himself that was cleansed by the blood of the lamb. It comes out of the grave in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the foundations are found in the grave, but they're revealed through resurrection. And it's upon that resurrection revelation that God sets everything in motion. Do you know that there is no grace available at the cross? It's established at the cross, but it comes at the resurrection. If you just have the cross in your life, but you don't believe in the resurrection, I think everybody here does, but if you don't, then you live with the revelation of the cross as if it's law. Grace comes at the resurrection, and the house of God is built out of the grave in resurrection lift so that the fullness of God can dwell on earth with man. We are living stones. God is using us to fashion for himself a place on earth to dwell. A place on earth to dwell. Do you remember Solomon at the building of the temple? Anybody remember Solomon? What about Moses? Yeah, remember Solomon? Okay, good, great. Nobody's really giving me the... I like, interact with me here, okay? Let me go, this is a good one. This is a good one. <laughs> Solomon at the temple stop, stops for a moment and he, in his dedication prayer, and he stops for a moment and kind of looks up and he wonders, he said, but could God ever really dwell on earth with man? Like, you see, he really got it. He really understood that unless God did something miraculous, it was impossible. Unless God built himself a temple, not, not David, not Solomon, but unless God built himself a temple, then the idea of God dwelling on earth with man, that we could all dwell together in the same place, was impossible. And that's what makes the cross, the revelation of the cross, and the resurrection 
absolutely foundational to everything that God is going to do on earth because the fact that we're here is an impossibility outside of Christ. You can have an event, you can have programs, you can come together for this and that. You can be a Christian club with Christian philosophy and moral guides of how you should live a moral and pure life. But without the cross and the resurrection, without the incarnation, the virgin birth, the cross, the death, the resurrection, the giving of the spirit, then the house of God on earth is not a place we will dwell when God's in it. We can't be in the house when God's here. But this morning, his presence is rich. It's thick. It's incredible. Because he has decided that he wants two things. You go from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Maybe I said this 14 months ago when I was here. God wants two things. There's only two things that God wants. Well, he wants more than that. But th these are the common threads throughout all of the scripture he wants a people for himself. God wants a people for himself. He longs to have a people that he can call his own. And the second thing he wants, he wants a place on earth that he can dwell with his people. Those are the two things. If you want to know what's in the heart of God, I can tell you he wants a people for himself and he wants a dwelling place on earth with his people. And so... The house of the Lord, the foundations of the Lord have already been set. But there's still more things that God is doing. Do you believe that? God, I'm not, I'm not talking extra biblical material here. I'm talking about his kingdom. And so God is looking for those who are willing to be those living stones that he builds into what he's doing and some of those people are apostolic people. And whenever they're built into the house and the apostolic is embraced, what happens is that it releases a whole new generation of pioneers, of those trailblazers. It's, 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 a, it's a time of not maintaining the status quo, but it's, a, it's time to break ground. Get out your Holy Spirit dynamite. Blow up the rock. It's new. It's new. It's new. Even though it's old God, the ancient of days. Showing us the ancient paths. And so foundations. I believe as, as, as you press into this more, you listen to the prophetic voice that's already here in the, in the room, you'll find out that God is speaking to you. It's about foundations. It's about foundations. It's about foundations. Now quickly turn. Quickly is for my benefit, not for yours. Can you turn, please, to, um, oh, let me think, Genesis 28, chapter 28. I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase this rather than read all the scripture. So we started with the scripture here, but maybe you can go to, um, you can go to verse uh, 16 and 17, please. So very quickly, just to review the story, Jacob is on his way. He gets to a certain place. It gets late. The sun goes down. He's tired. He takes a rock stone. He uses it, uses it as a pillow. He falls asleep. He has a dream. Some dreams are pizza dreams. Some dreams are God dreams. He has a God dream. In the dream, heaven opens up. Open heaven. We like open heaven. Say amen. 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 Okay. He has an open heaven experience. And when he looked, he, first of all, he sees a stairway. He sees a ladder going from heaven to earth. Underline that, make a note, we're going to come back to it. Heaven connects with earth. And he sees angels ascending and descending, because that's what angels do. They're in heaven, they're saying, we want to get out, we want to get out. Give us a ladder so we can go down. No, 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 that's just, I'm not making that up. So he sees what happens when we have an open heaven over us is we begin to see heavenly things. We see divine beings. We can't see them with the natural eye. We can't hear them. But when heaven becomes open to us, then we begin to experience from time to time, more people, more, some people more than others, we begin to experience divine heavenly things because heaven has been open to us. And so heaven's been opened to him. He sees the angels ascending and descending. And then God's standing there. And it's as if he, you know, there is 
uh, Jacob sleeping on his stone, and God stands at the, at the edge of the cliff of heaven and with, with this ladder in front of him, and he starts talking to him. Now, Jacob has some understanding of covenant because his father told him about it, and his father's father told him about it. And you can't go back too much because before that was before Abraham. But anyway, so anyway, he, but now God is saying to him, I'm covenanting, covenanting. I'm, I'm, I'm restating this covenant now to you. And as I said, in every generation, you need to have that moment that the covenant God speaks to you about his covenant with you and that he's going to be faithful to you, not because of what your parents did or your parents' parents did, but now he's saying you're here because of them, but now this is to you. To you, to you, to you. And he's speaking to me and he's saying, I'm going to be your God and I'm going to be with you wherever you go. And I'm, when I bring you back in this land and so on and so forth, we'll get to that. God speaks to him and he, 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 he brings him into that covenant relationship. Now we're going to look at verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. So he does... Two things here. First thing, he makes a de declaration. You know, I believe, I, and I want to encourage you here, every, anytime you've had an open heaven experience, anytime God's spoken to you, anytime you've received something that comes from the Spirit, declare it. The minute you wake up from the dream, the minute you get out of your bed, or whatever it is, driving in the car, for me, it's always in the shower, or while I'm shaving, you know, God starts speaking to me. I'm thinking, couldn't you wait until I'm done? <laughs> But he wakes up and he says, he declares that God is in this place. But he also says, so there's a declaration first. The second thing is a confession. And he confesses it and he says, I wasn't aware of it. You know, so often, even though we're in Christ right now, born again, spirit filled, there are moments when all of a sudden we wake up and everything's changed because of because of a God moment, and it's as if our perspective has changed and we're seeing things differently. And so he was confessing that. He was confessing that. Let's carry on and read. Surely the Lord is in this place. I was not aware of it. He was afraid. That's another confession, right? You know, if you have been, if you receive a full relation, uh, revelation of the living God and there's no fear on you, then chances are you've got a dumbed-down version of God. And I'm not saying frightened of God, but a holy fear that comes from looking into the face of the Almighty. If you just, if you just feel nothing afterwards, then chances are it's something else that you've seen. So he starts by declaring, then he confesses, I was not aware of it, he was afraid. And then he goes back to declaration, how awesome is this place, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gateway of heaven. This is a, he either had to be absolutely crazy off his head or he had, he had seen God. He was declaring very quickly, what he was declaring is this place, not the heaven place, but that place down there was the gateway to heaven. He wasn't declaring that up there was the gateway. He was saying on earth it was the gateway. He was saying, this, this place is heaven itself. This, 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 this is the dwelling place of the Most High God. This place. You see, when you have a God dream, if you don't wake up from it, then you will never understand the power of the revelation because it's only realized when you wake up and you live your life on earth. I saw a movie, any of you seen the movie Inception? Great movie. And in, in, in the movie, it's just, I won't go into it now, but there's levels of dreaming and stuff like that. And somebody finally asks, what happens if you die in the dream? And they said, well, if you die in the dream, you're stuck in it forever. The dream of God, what he reveals to us, is so that we wake up and the power of the dream is only realized in the reality of the place that he's put us to live. And so I could easily stand up here and be very cliche today and say, you know, keep on dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Dream your dream. The thing is, is that 
if you get stuck in the realm of dreaminess, you don't understand the revelation's power unless you bring it down to an earthly place that requires obedience and faith. Okay? It's really important. Okay, I'm really running out of time. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he'd placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the place Bethel, uh, though the city used to be called Luz. So he takes the stone. There's only one stone here, okay? There's one stone. And he takes the stone. It was his pillow. And he takes the stone. This is, he's had the revelation. His perspective has changed. He's made the declarations. He's confessed his mortality in, in the face of the Almighty, the Eternal. And he takes the stone as a marker. When the stone was like this, it was a foundation stone. It was a foundation stone. In other words, he goes from the dream to the revelation, and then the next thing he does, he starts to build. The stone becomes building material. Before, it was a, just a, a pillow. But now he takes the stone, and he says, this is foundational for a new city. Pioneering a new city because of a dream. He takes the stone, he says, this horizontally is a foundation stone, but I have an idea. I'm now going to put it like this, the same stone, and now it becomes a connection between heaven and earth. It becomes a pillar. It becomes a buttress that holds up heaven, a can the canopy of the revelation of his presence. It becomes something that strengthens the revelation that has just been given to him, and he anoints it. And he says, this is the place, or by that act, he's saying, this is the place where God revealed himself to me, and so this is the place I'm going to build. Instantly, there was a new name. If you follow in the scripture, whenever God gives anybody a new name, it's really significant. And so we go from this unknown place called Luz, except for the name, whatever happened to it afterwards, I don't know. But then it becomes Bethel, and that's where Bill Johnson lives. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> five minutes, five minutes. Okay, keep going. Okay. I'll just look at Father David. Keep going like that, I'll keep going. He has, everything's ordinary until the dream, he has the dream. And then it becomes extraordinary because God's revealed something. It changes his perspective. He starts to declare things that are ridiculous. The gateway to heaven, you know, this is the house of God. And then without even thinking of it, he takes the things around him and they become different. He looks at what you look at every Sunday when you come in here, but all of a sudden the eyes have been informed by the mind of God. And you see people different. You see opportunity different. You see resources different. And there becomes something that comes out of your belly. At least it comes out of my mind. And I've got this crazy need to build something. And I'm thinking, but I'm not a builder. But Jesus says to me, says to me but I am. And I'm living in you. And if you're in me and I'm in you and I'm in the Father and he's in me and you're in me, that means you're one with the Father. And that means that whole building thing in your belly is actually the Holy Spirit. And so what he does, I think perhaps without even realizing, is starts to build. And what he is now absolutely captured by is on earth a dwelling place for the Most High. We turn to the book of Ezra. We're going really deep, very quickly. So God's people are in Babylon. They're in exile. They want to get out. They want to get out so badly that they're projecting their thoughts and feelings onto prophets. So the prophets now are prophesying false prophecies about, oh, this won't last. Don't worry about it. Don't put up your laundry line yet, quite yet. You'll be out of here by next week. And finally, it so upsets God that finally God breaks the silence and he says, look, look these, this, these, this is false prophecy. They're prophesying what you want to hear. 
you're not going to get out of here short of a day of 70 years. You're not going to because this is, this is what I've said is going to happen. But I'll tell you what's going to happen is that once the 70 years is over, then I have plans for you. And not to harm you, but to prosper you. And so on and so forth. So here in Ezra, they're out of exile. Now, while they were in exile, they couldn't sacrifice and they didn't have a temple. So that's when, that's where, oy vey, synagogues. I love the synagogue. I go all the time. Synagogues came out of the, the exile, the Babylonian exile. But they get out of exile. Now they say right away, like a dog on a bone, we got to get back to sacrificial worship. So what do they do? They build. Build, 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 build. Are you getting this? There's a building thing here, a building theme today. Right? We should have a building theme picture up here next week. <laughs> and so they start to build. So they build an altar. That's the first thing they do. And if you read it, it's, we're in Ezra chapter 3. The seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their own towns and the people sent and assembled as one man in Jerusalem. Then so on and so forth. They get down to verse 3. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built on the altar on its foundations and sacrificed burnt offerings um, on it to the Lord both morning and evening. Then in accordance with what was written, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. Verse 5, after that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices, the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred feasts of the Lord, as well as those brought as free will offerings to the Lord. Verse 6, on the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundations of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. So, there are two things here. There's altars and there's temples. Whenever God says to you, go to the place that I have chosen, and in that place, build an altar for me, sacrifice upon it. When you do that, I will come. I will declare, this is the Lord speaking to Moses and Aaron, I will declare my name over you. That is, God declares his name over us rather than we declare his name. There's a big difference there, folks. He declares his name over us. He reveals who he is to those around and everybody sees the manifestation of the Lord. Altars are about worship. Altars are about worship. I won't get you to say that to the person beside you, but if you did, you would turn to them and say, altars are about worship. Did you know that? Yeah. Right? Yes. Altars are about visitation. It's when God comes and he appears. In the Old Testament, he came. In Leviticus 9, they do the same thing. God appears, all the people see the fire of his presence, right? This is, this is not tabernacle stuff. This is altars of worship, freestyle, in the open, right? No hiding, very public. They were frightened of the people, but yet they laid the foundations of the, 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 the altar and sacrificed upon it. But then they went on to lay the foundations of the temple, so the first thing I want to, if you haven't figured this out yet, is that if you're in a pioneering phase, the first thing that God will speak to you about is altars. Yes. Yes. Worship has to be established before you can go on and build anything. Yes. If you don't have the worship right, the next piece is going to fail. If you have a, somebody who's got this great idea and this great project and you say, you know, we should really need to get the intercessors together and pray more and we need to really worship over this for a while and the person, ah, don't worry about that, we'll just start building. Don't listen to them. Worship always comes first, and it's always done in such a way it will cost you something. It's not, it's not the kind of little happy, clappy, singspiration worship. It's when you do something that costs you something. In this case, it was publicly in front of their enemies, where they'd be criticized and mocked and so on and so forth. So that's what comes first. But then after that, see, you can get stuck on worship. You can get stuck and I say that respectfully, but you can put it, put it this way. You can get stuck on building altars of worship and forget about building the foundations to the temple. Because in God's heart, he wants you to worship him, but he wants a house on earth to dwell to be with you. And we can get so stuck in the worship piece that we forget that it's meant, it is meant to put something in place so that we get back to pioneering, that we get back to building. And so, the, they go on to that. They've got that. They figure it out. And we're going to go down to verse 10 and on, please. 
When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments, with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise, praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love to Israel endures forever. All of the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. This shouting in praise is something that's different from the sound of worship. It's still worship, but it's something more. There's something more about what they're seeing and how they're responding to it. Let's carry on. Verse 12, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could, un no one could distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of weeping. Isn't that interesting? It was undistinguishable. Because the people made so much noise, the sound was heard from far away. When they laid the foundations to the altar and sacrificed on it, there was no shouts for joy and sounds of weeping. That didn't happen at the altar. But when they finally laid the foundation to the house of God, that's when you heard great weeping. And that's when you heard great shouts of joy. You don't hear it when you lay the foundations to the altar. But when the house of God is laid, when the foundations are put in place, that's when an older generation who remembers the past moves of God. That's when some of us in this room remember the charismatic move in New Zealand. Or you remember scripture and song that went around all over the world. Or you remember that New Zealand, the church in New Zealand used to be the number one missionary sending church nation in the world, but not anymore. You know, some of us are old enough to remember the last move of the Spirit. Some of you are so young, you've never had a move of the Spirit, ever. I mean, you have good stuff. You have doctrine, and you have Bible understanding, and you have your own personal relationship with God, but you corporately yet haven't had a move of the Spirit. When those old people started to see something that was precious to them and real to them being reestablished, this was like dreaming the dream again. This was more than the dream. It was the reality because the dream wasn't in heaven anymore. It was being brought to earth. And they cried because they, because of, they went in that moment from hopelessness to hope that it really will happen in our time. Like Simeon at the gates waiting to see the fulfillment of the promise that his eyes would see the Messiah before he'd go to be with God in all eternity. The crying was a crying of those people who had carried a promise for such a long time, almost at the end of their lives, thinking maybe we were wrong, maybe we didn't get it, maybe this will never happen again. Before their very eyes, they saw foundations being led, being laid to the house of God on earth, and they began to weep. And there was another generation there, a younger generation. They hadn't seen the former temple, but they understood. They understood. They had something in their heart. They had a witness. They had, there, was, there was something in their guts, and they knew that this was God, and it was special, and it was wonderful. But because they hadn't, they weren't working, they weren't walking in hopelessness despair. They were just thinking, wow, this is great. And so they started shouting for joy. <laughs> Woohoo! This is great. But the two mixed so much that you couldn't tell the difference anymore. You know what happened? The two, it was like a Holy Spirit cocktail. It wasn't two noises. It was now a new noise and it was the sound of heaven on earth. There's a sound at the altar. There's a very different sound when you start to lay foundations. Yeah. So good. Very different sound. Yeah. Very good. And I just want to say to you that I believe that God is, God's heart is to pioneer through you if you're willing. God has new things in mind. Very good. But it's not just new, new, but it's about a generation that hasn't had the release yet to walk in things that we've had the the pleasure, we've had the privilege, we've had the, the joy of knowing. 
I feel like God's saying, yes, continue at the altar. Continue at the altar. More altars. More worship. Don't stop. But don't get stuck at the altar. You know what? When a generation gets stuck at the altar of worship over time, we worship worship and it expresses itself as segregation in the body. Old people say, I don't like those new songs. Young people say, I don't like the old songs. And what it does is something that's meant to bring us all together just ends up segregating us into our little worship boxes. The altar of worship is meant, it comes first, but it's meant to put something in place. It's all about his visitation. If altars are about visitation, then houses are about habitation. And God wants to dwell on earth with us. And he said, I will build my house. He's already given us the keys, right? Yep. We already have the keys. The kingdom of God that we have caught as a chosen people, as a royal priesthood, the kingdom of God that he's made us to be is about the kingdom on earth, not the kingdom in heaven. Yep. Jesus said, when you pray, don't pray with all those words like the pagans do. They go on and on and on, rat, tat, 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 tat. He said, pray this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. You see, why we're here, when you got saved, when you believed in Jesus, when you were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, your guilt removed, your shame gone, when you were filled with the Spirit, born again, why didn't he take you right into heaven at that point? I've often complained to him and say, why didn't you just take me out of this God-forsaken place? You know, why didn't I go straight to glory? You know, who really puts up their hand unless it's going well for you? Who really puts their hand up and say, you know, says, you know, I want to stay here forever. But he leaves us here because yeah. he's doing something on earth, in the earth, through his house. We are his house. And, and therefore, his glory can not only habitate, dwell with us, but it can manifest so that the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so, as his house, as his people, as the dwelling place of God on earth, he wants to bring us into that place of unity in his heart, unity in his mind, unity in his purposes, so that we're not a bunch of generations segregated by age or by sex, but that we're just one people on earth and that we are his kingdom and his glory is seen in us and through us. And that's, that's his goal. That's his plan. Father, thanks for today. Isn't it great he's got more? Isn't it great that he's got more? More in store for you, not just for me? More in store for us? You know, it's always both ends. It's not just either or. It's not just you as an individual or us as a people. But God, will. the way we come to Christ is individually. I can't repent on your behalf. You can't repent on mine. And so I have to come to Christ. You have to come to Christ. But once we're in Christ, we, we can, he continues to meet with us. He speaks to us. We're still the children of God. But if we don't move into that corporate thing, then we never get into pioneering because pioneering is about the house. Yes. It's always about the bigness of God rather than the individual experience of God. We start with the individual thing at the altar. In our prayer, in our receiving of Christ, it begins at the cross. The cross is a moment. It's meant to open up the destiny and purpose of God for us on earth. It's the other side of the cross where we find the kingdom. And so, today God is saying, if you hear my heart, if you begin to understand my mind, then by faith, step into that place of believing that God wants to do something bigger and more wonderful in and through you because you are his people and he longs to dwell on earth, have a dwelling place with the people of God. So, Father, thank you. Thank you that you haven't left us to our own. Thank you, God. Please don't leave me as I am. Change me into the likeness of Jesus. So, Father, we lift our hearts to you now. We give you thanks for all that we've received from you, but all the more that's yet to come. We pray that you glorify yourself in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Would you please stand for a moment? This is going to be really quick. Keep your eyes open or you're going to miss it. Just turn to the person beside you. If the person beside you is your wife or your husband, find somebody else. And would you just quickly declare over each other that God is in the house and that you are a living stone and therefore you are part of the house? Can you do that right now in Jesus' name? Everybody say, Mark, that was good. That was good. Now, there may be some here that are going, there's parts of that I didn't follow all that. Okay, that's okay. He wasn't speaking just to new beginning people, or he wasn't just speaking to older, mature people. He was speaking across the board to everybody. We're all one house, one generation, and the Bible puts it like there's one God and Father of us all. There's one Savior, there's one baptism, one faith, not multiple. So we're going to rest in that, right? Chew on that, pray on that, believe on that. Tonight, he'll be back, there'll be more. There'll be more. In the meantime, what? Yeah. Go online and see the first service because this message was completely different than the first service, okay? But it adds to it and builds on it. So to get the full picture, you actually need to, to, to watch the first service. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, just one more thing. Ladies, breathe. <laughs> we shouted, you breathe. Right. This Friday night, as a reminder of that, so get tickets, go online, different things. Please uh, uh, participate in this that's taking place. If you feel like you want to and feel moved in your heart as a free will offering type of thing that you would like to sow into Mark and Jane's ministry, uh, you can do it through online uh, giving or you can do it at F+. Plus. Just mark it Banyard or Mark and Jane. Just make it sure that we have notice of that so that we can get it to them. Mark, Mark. All right. God bless you. Have an outstanding day. Pancakes out in the foyer for sale. Pancakes in the foyer for sale. God bless you.